Well, yesterday our nation celebrated its 233rd birthday. Amen. 1776. Wow. I hope uh, you had a chance to relax, and I hope that uh, you got to enjoy some of the, the spectacle of the fireworks. And so that kind of leads us to the title of our lesson this morning, simply entitled, God's Fireworks. Wow. We're going to go back into the book of 1 Kings. The date is about 850 B.C. And we read in chapter 17 these words. Now Elisha the Tishbite, from Tishbe and Gilead, said Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. And so right here begins a drought. And God brings a drought upon the nation of Israel because he wants to see that there's a spiritual drought in the land. Chapter 18, verse 1. After a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. Well, Ahab, of course, is the evil king of Israel. And the Bible says that now this drought has produced a famine. And so God is bringing a hardship upon his people so that they will turn to him. Well, we see now the coming together of the evil king, Ahab, and God's prophet, Elijah. Verse 17. When Ahab saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? Well, let's just say that they weren't on too good of terms right there, amen? I've not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Wow. wow. If you read a little bit earlier, you'll find that Ahab had an assistant who was a godly man named Obadiah. And he had hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets in the cave. But as you can see right here, Elijah feels like he's taking a stance. Because you've got to ask yourself, is someone really a prophet if they're hiding in the caves? And Elijah was a fearless prophet of God. He goes up against the most powerful man in all of Israel. And with the rebuke that's given to him, he turns it around. He's called a troubler of Israel. And he says, listen, I've not made trouble for Israel. You have. Because you have gotten Israel to break the word of the Lord and to follow the Baals and the Asherahs. He says, here's the thing. It's time for the people to be called to a decision. He says, Ahab, you meet me on Mount Carmel and you bring your 450 prophets of Baal. And while you're at it, bring the other 400 prophets of Astra, that's the female God, along with them. And the Bible says that Ahab sent word out throughout all the land for these prophets to come. But of course, they heard about the great showdown that was going to take place on Mount Carmel. And so not only did the prophets all come, but the people come. And Elijah addresses the people and he says, how long will you waver between two opinions? There's a famine in the land. There's a drought in the land. How long will you waver? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. And the Bible says the people said absolutely nothing. Let's read on. Then Elijah said to them, I'm the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bowls for us. Let them choose one for themselves and let them cut into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set on fire. I will prepare the other bowl and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of the Lord your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. 
And then all the people said, what you say is good. They go, wow, now we're going to find out. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare first, since there are so many of you. Call the name of the Lord your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given to them and prepared it. And they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response, no one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, which was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time of evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered, and no one paid attention. Well, Elijah was taunting these prophets, not just to taunt them in their false prophecy and false doctrine, but to show the people what a powerless God they had been turned to. And then we read this. Verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes, descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two sea of seeds. He arranged the wood, cut the bowl into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are the God of Israel, and that I am your servant, and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so that these people will know that you, O God, are the Lord, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then fire from the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Then Elijah commanded them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let anyone get away. Seize them. And Elijah brought them down to Kishon Valley and slaughtered them there. Wow, that's intense. See, that's God's fireworks, amen? Right here, after a half a day of the, seeing the futility of the so-called prophets of Baal and calling down fire from their God, who did not exist, Elijah, the Bible says, built the altar. Why? Because it was in ruins. It had been unused for so long. And then he did something that all the Israelites would understand. He built the altar out of 12 stones. One stone represented for each one of the tribes of Israel. He put the wood on it. He slaughtered the bull. And then he says, okay, guys, we need some water over here. I dug a trench around this thing. Pour water on it. One time. Second time. Third time. There was so much water poured on the altar that the Bible says the trench was filled with water. And then Elijah prays. And he prays the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He says, let it be known today that you are the God of Israel and I am your man. And the Bible says that fire fell from heaven. Can you just picture it? This, 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 this ball of fire just rocketing towards Mount Carmel. I'm sure the people watched it come on in. They saw it come on in and... <laughs> Life didn't have to say anything. The Lord, everybody's going, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. See, God is obvious. Are you with me here, church? But there was more that had to be done. The land had been polluted with false teaching. And the false prophets had to be killed. So Elijah says, okay, guys, we're going down the mountain. And we're going to slaughter these people that have taken you away from our God. 
and the prophets, blood was washed away by the stream. Let me read on. Verse 40, 41. And Elijah said to Ahab, go, eat, drink. There's a sound of heavy rain. Now remember, it hasn't rained for three years. So Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. It was time to pray again. Amen? Go and look towards the sea, he told a servant. And he went up and looked. There was nothing there, he said. Seven times, Elijah said, go back. The seventh time, the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. And Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose, a heavy rain came on, and Ahab rode off to Jezreel. The power of the Lord came upon Elijah, and tucking his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Now, this prophet was in shape. Amen, guys? The Lord brought the rain back because the people's hearts had been turned back to their God. And the water represents the life that only Jehovah God can give us. Amen, church? You know, it occurs to me, this scene where this one gutsy man calls upon the so-called people of God to make a decision could be repeated in America today. He says, how long will you waver between two opinions? And in their silence, they saw the aging prophet build the altar, put the wood in the bowl, the water on, and the ball of fire come, and they knew that God was their Lord, and Elisha was their man. The first area that I believe America wavers in is in the area of salvation. Turn to Acts chapter 2. In Acts 2, the Spirit records the beginning of God's church. Peter is preaching to literally thousands of people on the day of Pentecost. And he ends the sermon in verse 36, and he says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to heart and said to Peter and other apostles, Well, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 41. Those who accept this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. They devoted themselves, the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. I mean, it was obvious God was with these people. Amen? Amen. All right here, Peter lays out from the scriptures how to be saved. First of all, there was the preaching of the cross of Jesus Christ. And the people's response is, yes, we believe not only that Jesus is the Son of God, but we understand that our sins crucified him. Now what do we do? He says, if you believe that, then you need to repent. You need to turn away from your deeds of darkness and you need to turn to make Jesus Lord and become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Totally sold out, willing to go anywhere, do anything, and give up everything. He says, then... You need to be water baptized for two reasons. One is to get your sins forgiven. Because you see, sin separates us from God. And two, to receive the Holy Spirit, which gives you the power to live the Christian life. Amen? And the Bible says, those who accept this message, they were baptized. 3,000 were baptized that day. And then it says, all of them were devoted to the apostles' teaching, the word of God, the fellowship, the breaking bread, and prayer. And everyone was filled with With awe, it was obvious who God's people were. But you know, in America, there are so many opinions about salvation. There are many believe that all you have to do to be saved is just be baptized as an infant. Now, they don't remember the occasion, of course, but they believe that your parents, their parents' faith could save them. The Bible says, no, it's your faith in God, in the power of the Spirit, in the waters of baptism. 
Colossians 2.12. There's another huge group that says, all you have to do is just say a prayer and you're good to go. No, my friend. It takes a lot more than a prayer. You got to repent of your sins. You got to become a disciple. And then you have to be immersed in the water to share in Christ's death and burial. Why? Because it was in his death that he shed his blood. And it's the blood of Jesus that forgives you of your sins. But there's a third one. Well, if I live a good moral life and I believe in Jesus, I know I'll go to heaven. I mean, isn't everybody? That's a commonly held belief. You know, it's interesting. The other day, uh, I heard this song. And it's, it's kind of a country song. But, but it's got a reggae beat to it. And it's, it's by a guy, pretty well popular fellow named uh, Kenny Chesney. And the name of the song is, Everybody Want to Go to Heaven. Let me just read you a couple of verses. Preacher told me last Sunday morning, son, you better start living right. You need to quit the women and the whiskey and carrying on all night. Don't you want to hear him call your name when you're standing at the pearly gates? I told the preacher, yes, I do. But I hope they don't call today. I ain't ready. Everybody want to go to heaven. Have a mansion high above the clouds. Everybody want to go to heaven. But nobody want to go now. Last verse. Everybody want to go to heaven? Hallelujah. Let me hear you shout. Everybody want to go to heaven, but nobody want to go now. I think I speak for the crowd. I think I speak for the crowd. God in his wisdom made us as jars of clay that have a time limit. And we don't know when it's coming. Michael Jackson, 50 years old. Jesus came like a thief in the night. Yesterday, a very famous NFL quarterback, Steve McNair, murdered. 36 years old. A thief in the night. You know, very interestingly... The same week that Michael Jackson passed, another iconic person, Farrah Fawcett, died. And her passing, she was 62. It was very interesting to me, just, the, just the, the evil of the press, stressing over and over again that this, one of the most beautiful of women, had anal cancer. I mean, they just wanted to just, just make it gross. That's the world. Chew you up and spit you out. She had a very famous poster. So her in a red bathing suit. It hangs at the Smithsonian. That's how iconic she was. It's very interesting. A lot of the blogs talking about her death. Because she was famous in a, a TV show called Charlie's Angels. And she was one of the angels. And somebody in the blog said something to the same effect of, well, it's great that her pain has passed because now she's really become an angel in heaven. And that's what a lot of people want to do at a funeral. They want to romanticize the moment to make themselves feel comfortable. And they think not only everybody want to go to heaven, but everybody's going to heaven. But if her life is as it seemed and measured against the word of God, she has not promised salvation. The torment of cancer here on this earth is a blessing to those that have it. So they think long and hard about the torment that awaits them or the peace that awaits them in heaven. As disciples, we understand that it is our mission, it is our purpose to seek and save the lost. We cannot be fuzzy about who is saved and who is lost. The Bible teaches only one way to be saved you got to have faith that Jesus rose from the dead. you got to have an understanding that he died for your sins. Then you need to repent, turn away from your sins, turn to becoming a disciple, and then you are water baptized to have your sins forgiven and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the only way the scriptures teach to be saved. 
But you know, a lot of us waver between two opinions. And that's why we never bring anybody to church. Because we're not sure if they're saved or lost. Let me tell you something. Jesus didn't die so his people would be fuzzy about who is saved and who is lost. The scriptures are clear. Are you with me, editor? You know, today, I'm, I am so fired up about Amari getting baptized. Now, I, I still remember when his mom dragged him, I mean, uh, brought him to church. And, uh, you know, it was sad. I mean, he, he would just sit there like a bump on the log, like a lot of kingdom kids do. Coming because they got to. Not singing. But you know something? After a while, it started to get to him. Brothers started reaching out to him. Maybe this church thing isn't too bad. <laughs> you know, it's been amazing seeing the, 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 the transition. He's a fine young man. But you know what's been beautiful for me to see over the last couple of weeks as he's been studying the Bible is now there's light in his eyes. You've seen that transition? When, when, when somebody is studying, even if they're from a religious background, but when they're studying the Word of God and then they're applying the Scriptures about being a disciple, you see an amazing thing happen. You see this transition from darkness to light, and you can see it in their eyes. As that fire was on Mount Carmel, it was obvious. Oh, it was God's fireworks that day. But we need to understand that God's fire works. You apply the fire of God's word into anybody's life, and anybody can change, no matter where their life is at. Anybody can change. And when the word of God is accepted, it is the most unbelievable change. It's as obvious as fire coming down from heaven. You see, a lot of people... Like Kenny Chesney, look at the, the Christian life as a time of no fun. But Jesus said, I have come to bring life that you may have it abundantly. Let me tell you something. The Christian life is the most awesome thing. Because when you rid yourself of sin, when the Lord forgives you, there is a light, there is a peace, there is a joy that nothing in this world can give you. Amen? Amen. God's fire works. The second place where people waver between two opinions is in restorations. Turn to Luke chapter 15. I shared a few weeks ago that this is the passage that I always begin with when I want to study with someone who's fallen away from God. It's, of course, the parable of the prodigal son. I think most of us are familiar with the fact that the younger son takes his father's inheritance and leaves home and squanders it in wild living. But finally, famine comes. <laughs> and then we read that he comes to his senses, and then in verse 20, we pick it up. So the young son got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals, his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. You know, certainly, Ryan Casares 
understands the feeling of the father in here, seeing his son Christian come back to God. Amen, guys? And now right here, we see a God that's waiting for his prodigal sons and daughters to return. Not a God waiting with lightning bolts to, to shish kebab him and fry him. <laughs> but a God that wants his boy back. A God that wants his precious daughter back. He's waiting. He's watching. And when the first steps are made, God starts coming after us. And the Bible says he grabs us and hugs us and kisses us. Puts a robe and a ring to mark that we're in the family. And they kill the fatty calf. You know, certainly, I think all of us were, were very, very touched by Christian's restoration today. But you know, there are many other people that haven't made this decision. And the reason that people haven't made the decision to be restored... Is they're wavering between two opinions. They're wrestling with whether the world is kind of better or the Lord is kind of better. And they've taken their eyes totally off God. They're trampling the blood of Jesus with their lives. As they waver and wrestle with what life do they like better? You know, it's interesting that there were actually two fallaways in this story. The first is the young son, but then is the older son that we often don't read very much. Let's see if we can understand this. The young son's just come home, they're celebrating, it's awesome. Verse 25, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what's going on? Your brother's come, he replied, and your father's killed the fatted calf because they have him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours comes, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and is found. Now what escapes some people right here is the older son is also outside the house. And God, the father, has to go to the older son. But the older son thinks that because he's at church and obedient, that he somehow is right with his father. But it's obvious, he's bitter towards God. See, what a lot of people don't understand, the younger son fall away. It's one that's obvious because he's out there in the world, never goes to church, just out there in heathenistic activities. But you can be the older son and fall away and still come to church every Sunday morning. Well, let's, let's go look at this in Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians 5, Paul addresses just such individuals. Beginning in verse 3, this is, this is, this is hard line, guys. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality, of any kind of impurity or greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man's an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. Look at this now. For once you were darkness, but now you're the light of the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it's shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by light becomes visible. For it is the light that makes everything visible. 
This is why it said, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. The concept of sleep in the Bible is always a parallel to death. And he's saying, you guys that are asleep in the light, you guys that are asleep in the church, wake up. You know, it's sad to say, even this morning, I saw a couple of people come on in, and they just kind of moseyed on in. Don't tell me you had one cranking quiet time. See, these people right here, Though they were in the church, they were asleep. Why were they asleep? Because they were idolatrous. Oh, I don't see any Baal or or, um, Astra here. Oh, no, 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 no. He's talking about different idols. He's very clear right here in verse 5. He says, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of God. It doesn't get any clearer than that. You know, if you're immoral... And you call yourself a Christian, you're asleep, and you are not in a safe condition before God. If you're impure, and we're talking impurity means things like pornography on the internet, going to chat rooms on the internet, and masturbation. Oh, get this. There there are some that have taught. That, that within marriage, they can watch pornography together to get them going sexually. That is flat garbage. That is darkness. If you're in that condition, you're asleep. And you're not right with God. Greed. Say, I hardly have any money. Doesn't mean you can't be greedy. So how's that? Well, let's just lay it out here. For those that are visiting, we believe in laying out the word of God. And my my, my feeling is this. I'm just a servant of the Lord. If I teach something that's not in the word of God, then just blow it away like chaff. But if I teach something from the word, and it is the word of God speaking, then it's not me saying, it's God, and you need to flat repent. Greed. Our budget is built upon the pledges in our church. Our pledges come out to almost exactly $10,000. That's if everybody gave what they vowed to God. Last week, we gave 7600 Wow. What's that mean? Well, it means some people didn't give. Others held back some, like Ananias and Sapphira. Letting on that their pledge is one thing, but, you know, they handed in a check or they put a little money in. They didn't give. Some people said, well, I don't have a job. Well, the Bible says, if you don't have a job, you don't eat. And you'd be this fellowship. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. If you don't have a job, your job is to get a job. Not to live off unemployment. You know, we need to have a conviction that if we're holding back from the Lord, that is greed. You're a greedy person. You want something that you've promised to God. Wouldn't you be ticked off if this week on your paycheck, your boss says, you know something, I just don't want to give you what I said I was going to give you. Um, I'm holding back a fourth. Because I really want to do something with the money. <laughs> Would you be ticked or not? But believe it or not, it ticks God off when we don't follow through with our word. And I challenge you, if you didn't give last week, then you make it up this week. See, if, if we're going to be restored, we can't have idols in our lives. See, you can be a church and you can still be idolatrous. Of immorality, impurity, or of greed. And the Bible says these things put us asleep because it pulls our hearts away just as sure as shooting as Baal and Astra did in the Old Testament. But you know something? 
When a person gets restored, you see it. I mean, couldn't you see it this morning in Christian? For those of you that have fallen away, it's time to stop wavering between two opinions. You need to repent because God wants you back. He'll take you back. He'll forgive everything you've done. But you got to repent. And remember, the Bible never talks about repenting. It talks about repent. Amen? Third point. We've talked about wavering between two opinions on salvation, restorations, and now communication with God. That's prayer. Prayer didn't remind with the Asians, so we went with the communications right there. Amen? Let's turn to the book of James. James 1. This is powerful. Verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of any kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. You ever been there? Perseverance must finish its work so that you can be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's double-minded man, unstable in all he does. See, we can even go through the motions of prayer, but we don't really believe that God is going to answer us. And yes, sometimes the answer is no. (laughs) See, we say, God hasn't answered my prayer. Oh, yeah, he did. He answered it, no. He says, when you're going through trials, you need to be praying. You need to pray for wisdom. Now, look how he closes out the book. This is incredible. Verse 15, chapter 5. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If he sinned, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah is a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Wow. Prayer works. When... What's the Bible say right here? You're righteous. How do you become righteous? Never sinning? Well, you would be righteous, but you're never going to do that. So how do you become righteous? You've got to confess your sins. If you're not in a relationship, and we have discipleship partner relationships here in the church. If you're not in a relationship where you're confessing your sins regularly, let me tell you something. Darkness is going to come into your life. And there will be an ever-increasing amount of sin in your life. We all got to get open. We got to get open. You know, it's interesting right here that James cites Elijah and the very passage we talked about this morning. It says, Elijah's a man just like us. You know, sometimes we put these prophets up on some pedestal like, oh, they're incredible guys. No, no, he's a man just like us. Implication, if we're righteous, our prayers can be just as powerful and as effective as Elijah. Does that fire you on up or not? You know, one of the the brothers that I love a lot is going to be doing communion today. And that's uh, Lujak Martinez. And I still remember when Lujak got baptized in 1986 at Harvard. And that was a miracle, let me tell you something. That was was amazing. (laughs) And the, the thing that he's shared many times before is that the first thing on his heart, and naturally so, was that his family would be saved. And so he came back with the mission team in 89 here, and very quickly his mom got baptized, his two sisters, and his brother. But you know something? His dad didn't. But he kept praying. And 20 years later, in 2006, Big Lou was baptized. Amen? Yeah. And that was awesome because just two days ago on Friday was the anniversary of Big Lou's death. And I had the privilege to be with with Lou Jack and some of his family just to, to be able to talk and share and pray about it. But, you know, 
See, different than the world, we know Big Lou is in heaven because he's a baptized disciple. Amen, guys? Prayers are powerful and effective. It was very interesting this week. Uh, we're going to staff, and Elena goes, can I talk to you for a second? We're driving the car. I'm going, well, yeah. She says, I don't know if I need to confess something. I go, uh-oh. She says, well, I, I felt really badly last night because we'd gotten a call from uh, this, this, this family overseas where the father of the man had died. And uh, Elena said, I, I don't know what I should confess. He says, you know, I've been praying the last two days that the wife who's had to wait hand and foot on this guy who's persecuted her faith, the father-in-law, that either he would become a Christian or that God would kill him. I go, wow. <laughs> We're doing all right, okay? We're doing good? <laughs> We're good to go here. That should frighten you. That is how powerful prayer is when a righteous person prays. Our last point. Do not waver between two opinions in salvation, restoration, communication with God, and finally, the evangelization of the nations. You know, it's been very interesting to me over the past several weeks. I've been studying out the book of Psalms. And I've been very fascinated by the theme that God is the God of all nations. And it got me thinking a little bit, even about the words of Jesus. Turn to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. In Acts 1, in verse 8, Luke records Jesus' last charge to the 11 faithful apostles. We know it as the Great Commission. A lot of times we use the Matthew 28 one, which is probably said on another occasion, but here Jesus says right before he ascends to heaven, in verse 8, chapter 1, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Wow. Yeah, it's very interesting. No words of Jesus are by chance. And by golly, if these are his last words, you know these have huge, huge implications. Now, it didn't hit me until I was thinking about the scriptures. And I remembered Paul's first sermon on his missionary journey in Pisidian Antioch. Turn there in Acts chapter 13. Jesus made it very clear the apostles were to start in Jerusalem. Then the movement would go to Judea. Then the movement would go to Samaria. And then to the ends of the earth. In the same book, the Spirit, through Luke, writes this. And this is in Pisidian Antioch. We pick up the reading in verse 44. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and talked abusively against what Paul was saying. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it, do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life. We now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I've made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Wow. That's a quote from Isaiah, chapter 49. But the phrase is there. The Gentiles were equivalent to going to the ends of earth. The earth. They were to go to the Gentiles. They were to go to the ends of the earth. Interesting to me, we live at a time when people waver on whether or not we are to believe in the evangelization of the nations in this generation. As a matter of fact, 
Many of our former fellowship say it's impossible. They call those who believe it false teachers. And yet right here in the Bible, Paul says that by going to the Gentiles, we're going to the ends of the earth. Now it occurred to me when I was studying the book of Psalms that the Psalms were not only part of the Jewish Bible, but it would have been the Bible of the early church. As a matter of fact, the book of Psalms would have been its songbook. So this is what they would be singing. Turn to Psalm chapter 8. Verse 1. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You recognize that? You should. It's a song. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic. Okay, oh, amen. I'll, I'll, amen. Amen. <laughs> See, we still sing it today. See, a lot of people say, well, it's just the Old Testament. You can't say it's just the Old Testament. Yes, we no longer practice the Mosaic law where we're slaughtering the bulls and the sheep. But the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable, is useful, in correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. In other words, it's to be applied to our lives. You can't write off the Old Testament. It is the Word of God. It's not just the Word of God. It was the very Bible. There wasn't even a New Testament in the New Testament times. This is their Bible. This is their songbook. And so in the first century, they'd be singing, Oh Lord, oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And you can't sing a lie, can you? They would have believed that. Amen, church? Well, look at all the other scriptures. Chapter 9, verse 11. Sing praise to the Lord, enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what he has done. This is what they were singing. Chapter 19. Verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words, to the end of the world. Now, the New Testament Christian has a lot more understanding of these words now. But just like their Jewish brothers before them, this is what they sang. They believed in the God of all nations and that his words were to go to the end of the world. Just like Jesus said. Turn to chapter 24. Verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Chapter 33, verse 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. That's God's heart. Verse 45. Or scripture. Chapter 45. Verse 17. I will perpetuate your memory through all generations. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. Not just all nations, but all generations. 46. Beginning of verse 6, nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord. The desolation is brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. That is the heart of God. And that is what our brother sang. Chapter 49, verse 1. Hear this, all you people. Listen, all who live in the world. Chapter 57. Verse 9. I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations. I will sing of you among the people. For great is your love reaching to the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the sky. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be all over the earth. I mean, you get a pattern happening right here, guys? This is a cool one. Chapter 61, verse 2. From the ends of the earth I call you. 
I call as my heart grows faint, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Well, we get another modern day psalm for that one. Amen, guys? But the thing that's cool right here, it says, from the ends of the earth I called you. Now, all the other ones, it talks about God being the God of the ends of the earth and where to go the ends of the earth. But the cool thing right here, the psalmist says, hey, I'm at the ends of the earth. Thank you for hearing me. <laughs> Amen. So it's good to know, no matter where you're at, God can hear you. Amen. But his heart is to get to everybody at the ends of the earth. Chapter 64. Verse 9. All mankind will fear. They proclaim the works of God and ponder what he has done. Chapter 66. Verse 1. Shout with joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to God. Your name. Chapter 67. Verse 7. God will bless us and all the ends of the earth will fear him. Now I could go on and on, but we do want to get out of here before evening time. Amen? I challenge you, go through the Psalms and see if it doesn't say, God is the God of all the nations and he wants his glory. All over the world in this generation. Amen, church? Amen. You know, it's kind of interesting. I have to kind of ask myself, why would anybody not want to believe in evangelizing the nations in this generation? Why wouldn't they want to? I mean, they believe it's good for mom and dad and brothers and sisters. They, they want their brother and sister to become a Christian. But why wouldn't they want everybody's? And everybody is somebody's mom, dad, brother, sister, son, daughter. Why? What kind of heart wouldn't want to believe that? Why do you waver between two opinions? I mean, do you have that etched deep into your heart? That the dream of Jesus was to go to the ends of the earth, and that was the dream of the church? Here's the most amazing thing. They already did it in the first century. In Colossians 1 verse 6, it says, all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing. Verse 23 goes on to say, this gospel has been proclaimed to every creature unto heaven. If they could do it in the first century, don't you think we could do it in the 21st century? But why would someone be against evangelizing the nations in a generation? I said, why, why would they want to do that? You know, it's pretty amazing. Isaiah chapter 32 verse 8 says, A noble man makes noble plans, and by his noble deeds he stands. See, God is all about blessing. A noble plan. You know, we have a plan to evangelize the nations in this generation. You know, we really believe with all of our heart, if you're visiting with us, we believe with all of our heart that you could take a group of disciples and if you keep them free of sin, they're open, they're transparent. If you keep lukewarmness out, they will multiply ad infinitum and evangelize a whole city. Doesn't mean everybody becomes a Christian. As a matter of fact, Jesus says, few that enter the way. But a whole city will hear. I mean, we read about there in Acts chapter 13. All of Pisidia and Antioch heard in a couple of weeks. For us, a whole city can hear just two or three good internet articles. We're good to go. We got L.A. covered. That's not necessarily good news. It's bad news sometimes. Well, those are those people, they don't believe it's okay to live together. Those are the people, they don't believe that homosexuality is okay. Those are those people, so narrow-minded, we hate them. I thought you were open-minded. You hate because the light exposes the darkness. You know, we really believe that if you have a group of disciples in a city... That if you keep that group free from sin, they're 
confessing their sin, they're transparent. You keep lukewarmness out, then not only will they spread through the city, they'll spread through the nation. We actually believe that if you could get to the, say, 12 most influential cities of the world, and you put a group of disciples into each one of those cities, and you kept them free of sin. In other words, they were open. They were transparent. They confessed this, and you kept lukewarmness out. That they could not only spread through that city, but they would spread through the surrounding nations, and in time, throughout the nations. And we could evangelize the nations in this generation. Amen? You know, many might come up with their own list of what are the most influential cities of the world. But most would include these cities. Los Angeles, New York, London, Paris, Santiago, Mexico City, Sao Paulo, Moscow, Delhi, India, maybe Chennai, uh, Hong Kong, maybe Shanghai, Sydney, Johannesburg, and Cairo. You know what's exciting? We either have church plantings or remnant groups in over half of those cities already. That is awesome. What's really exciting is in just a couple of weeks, we're going to have a new remnant group in Johannesburg, South Africa. Chris Van Staten, you know, who was here for a little while, went on the New York mission team. Well, his visa ran out, and so he had to go back to South Africa. He'd been away from South Africa for a couple of years. He called back his old boss there in Johannesburg. He says, I got to come back. And the boss says, hey, I got a job waiting for you when you come to the city. See, God is with us. It's obvious. You know, I've just got to ask you, are you going to waver in your conviction about the evangelization of the nations in this generation? How quickly it stings us. Michael Jackson, 50. <laughs> Farrah Fawcett, 62. Wow. And we almost forgot it. And then... Another sting. Steve McNair, 36. Wow. We're not promised another day. You know, I'm so inspired by the church down in Santiago, Chile. And uh, we support that church financially. And one of the, the people that we help support is a man named Carlos Gallardo. Now, he's an elder in training, amen? And he, he lives on $500 a month. I mean, this is a sacrificial dude. What's exciting, he went full-time, and just a short time after he went full-time, his dad, Eduardo, 82 years old, became a disciple. Is that awesome? Now, you're pretty fired up about it. Here's the thing, though. His father's now in the hospital with liver cancer. And liver cancer is 95% fatal. And Matt, the preacher we support down there, Matt says going into that cancer ward is it's darkness and gloom and tears. Everybody's heart's heavy because they know that you only usually leave dead. He says, but you know there's light when you get around Eduardo. Here he is, 82, just became a disciple, and he's sharing his faith with the nurses, with the doctors, with the, with the other guys there in the ward. He is on fire. Because he really believes that the Christian life is the abundant life. And he really believes the pain of this life will pass when he gets to heaven where there's no more tears, no more pain, no more crying. He really believes it. And so even though he's a baby Christian at 82 years old, he's preaching the word. I got a question. Do you really Believe in the evangelization of the nations? Well, you can answer very simply. Do you have a visitor out today? If you believe in the evangelization of the nations, sure, you get the next door guy coming. Or someone from work. See, we've, we've got to really look at ourselves. Sometimes we think we believe something, but we waver. If we really believe that Jesus is the answer, we are going to be preaching the word like Eduardo. Yeah, but he knows he's going to die. Yeah, that's what we forget. We're all going to die. I know it's just obvious. Eduardo and all the rest of the cancer patients. It's obvious as that fireball from heaven hitting 
the altar is just as obvious that God's fire works in 82-year-old disciple. He's just that different from everybody else around him. And so the challenge today is clear. No wavering between two opinions on salvation, restoration, communication with God, and the evangelization of the nations in this generation. Thank you, and God bless.